Um, hey all, welcome to Stop the PD Spying's Gender and Sexuality Group. Um, um, it's me, Chella. I work with Stop the PD Spying and Gender Justice LA and Swap LA. I do a lot of stuff, uh, hands on in the community. Um, and we have a group of panelists um, who are going to announce themselves. Oh, and my pronouns are she and they. Um, so, Genesette, would you like to? Yes. Thank you, Shella. Hi, everyone. This is Jenny Gutierrez. I am a community organizer at Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement. My pronouns are she, ella. Thank you. Okay. And Isaac? Everybody, my name is Isaac. I use they, them pronouns. Preference, he, him is okay and I'm with Gender Justice LA. Okay, and Hamid, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, and do you want me to do a quick uh, security brief as well? Yes. Okay, terrific. Hi, everybody. My name is Hamid, the he, him. I'm with Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, and I'm uh, going to be supporting Chella in facilitation. Um, just welcome, welcome. Really happy to see some folks. Uh, hey, Helen, haven't seen you. So, uh, so real quickly, I uh, just wanted to check in about some security features. And of course, we are a, an abolitionist group, so don't want to police ourselves. But just to maintain the sanctity of the space and, 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 and the sanctity for everybody's respect and honoring everybody's presence. Uh, what we did was that when you uh, dialed in, uh, you were muted. So, so right now, folks are going to stay muted, um, uh, and then the besides the, except the panelists, uh, which is Chella and Genesis and Isaac and myself, I'm sort of like doing the backup for that. Um, and in case if you want to make a comment or a uh, question, of course, my understanding is the conversation with our folks are going to be happening for the first 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll have a collective conversation because it's about power building. Um, and so if you want to just maybe uh, raise your hand, that's their feature, or also send us a message in the chat room. Now, the chat room has also been limited to host only, so it can't be to everyone and everyone and private messages only because uh, we did get Zoom bombed. <laughs> we were Zoom bombed in the chat room. So, so we're trying to kind of just keep that uh, going as well. Uh, and in case if you're on the phone, um, please uh, uh, keep this phone number handy. Uh, uh, it's 562-230-4578. Uh, that is my cell phone. And if people want to text a message or a comment or a question, uh, so at least, you know, it's accessible through the phone as well. Um, that's basically it, Chella. Did I cover everything? Yes, you did. Okay. All right. So, and it's being recorded, so it's going to be up, uh, uploaded on our website um, by tomorrow or by Friday. So, Jella, it's all yours. Okay, so let's jump right into the questions. Um, so, as we know, it is Pride Month, right? And historically, um, the T has been left out. Trans and gender nonconforming folks, especially trans women of color and trans undocumented folks, have been left out of the conversation. In what ways has that does that impact trans people, especially during the time of COVID, especially for the work that we're all doing? Uh, Genesis, you can go first. Yes, thank you, Chella. Again, so good to see you. It's been a minute since Mama. I talked to you. The impact that it's having on undocumented trans women specifically is really devastating. Um, being undocumented in this country already have tremendous challenges accessing the basic needs, and one of them is healthcare. And at the epicenter in New York City, where it's we heard at the beginning the most you know, news that were coming out, people having the highest numbers, and among them were the uh, undocumented trans community, the trans Latina community, black trans folks and things. So it's, in, in that we had a leader doing critical work in, in Queens, specifically Lorena Borjas, who, you know, unfortunately died of COVID-19. 
I already talked to other people in New York and they're really afraid of the virus that is happening, COVID-19. They're afraid of discrimination. They're afraid of violence. And they have a really hard time going to the hospitals, either have any symptoms whatsoever. So it's really impacting the community in, in a very bad way. And as we continue to have conversations, it's critical that we make sure we really go to the communities, we remain true to our base and do the really difficult grassroots organizing. So um, you'll hear people in different parts of the country as well, how difficult it's been to deal with the current crisis. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, I, I also wanted to mention that there's been a, that there was a, I know that there was, there was a movement for um, a specific trans woman that was um, locked up, right? Do you know about, uh, were you a part of that, that fight, Genesette? Um, it's someone from, who was, huh? From New York City? Yes. Uh, Leilene Polanco, is a, um, she was a Black, trans, -lat Afro-Latina woman mm -hmm. who was arrested and was set on a bail for $500, I believe. So she was in prison. And we were not directly involved with the campaign in the organizations, but we, the one, once we learned about her case, we had to also uplift her case and her legacy, her life, because there is a clear connection with the criminalization of undocumented LGBTQ folks and members of the community, specifically Black and Afro-Latinx people. And the injustices that happened, the dehumanization, not really respecting your gender identity, and just being locked up, you know, for a minor violation, it's unacceptable. And we sh shouldn't be, you know, having to launch campaigns on people who are arrested and, and unfortunately losing their lives. So, yeah, we, we did what we could on our end to make sure that when we were also uplifting other cases, for, for example, of... Uh, Joanna Medina, who died in ICE custody, and also a year, I think it, that was within the time frame of Leilene Polanco, that we wanted to, we, we organized a rally in El Paso, and we wanted to make sure that we also uplifted her case, that we brought uh, Black trans woman voices and denounced all these violations, yeah. Exactly, I can repeat the question. Um, so because it is Pride Week, right, and Pride Month, right, um, you know, just as well as I do, the T, trans folks and gender nonconforming folks have been let, left out of the conversation for so long. Um, how, how has the COVID, and it's kind of the same question we kind of addressed last month, or two months ago, but how has the COVID-19, um, you know, impacted trans people, especially the most marginalized of us, like trans youth and trans mm -hmm. elders um, in our movement. <sighs> yeah. Um, hey, everybody. Um, hey, Genesette. It's been a while. Good to see you. Um, right. Thanks for having me, Chella and Hamid. I am, um, yeah, things have shifted and changed so much since the last time I was on here. And yeah, just trying to, yeah, just trying to, to fill all the things and support in any way possible. Um, I think, you know, keeping up with like social media, even that is like a huge, um, it's, it's difficult, right? It's difficult to just like, you know, today earlier I saw a, um, a post that came up and I wasn't prepared for it. Um, it was a video um, and trigger warning um about you know uh, a, a trans woman who uh was being um uh attacked and um yeah and so i didn't you know i just i try not to watch those videos in detail because 
you know, after you see so many and hear so many, um, especially working in the trans community, it's, um, you know, I think in terms of, um, like, we know the issues that, that our communities are facing, specifically black and brown trans women of color. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that was kind of um, something that I wanted to just uh, bring up. I, I am still trying to find that post to kind of see who, who that was and to follow. But um, yeah, in terms of your question, I think, you know, uh, we, our communities are being impacted in so many ways. And I know pride has not been specifically a place for, um, uh, for trans and gender unconforming uh, two-spirit people because of um, the bureaucracy, the policing, all, all the things that happened at Pride that make it inaccessible. Um, it's not very accessible at all uh, to a lot of our folks. And um, I think that when, yeah, in this time though, I, so I wanna say two things, like yes, and for young people, for, for youth, like that is a place also um, for all the things like when I was a young person it was where I did all my hustles it was you know um, it was it was where I met people and it was also around celebrating queer and trans joy and you know um, I know we have different places now that that allow that to happen um, but I do think it's still um, an impact um, um, for many people just you know not being able to um, to have community and to celebrate with their folks um, and to, yeah, just to celebrate. So I think that that's just in general, COVID-19, you know, not being able to be around folks and, um, and it has a big impact on um, trans and gender unconforming to spirit folks and the mental health of, of our people, um, you know, cause we depend on, we have been depending on our community to be there in many different ways for us. And so that's our survival that is, um, you know, a way for, for us to, to help with like mutual aid. Um, and so I do think in a lot of ways it's, you know, everything is online and if you don't have access to certain um, like internet, for example, or, you know, working computers or, you know, what have you, um, it's hard to really get a lot of those resources that you're used to walking into um, a community center or, um, you know, something like that. So same issues though you know houselessness economic instability um you know uh, all the barriers of violence 100 percent and it's even um heightened at this moment and uh yeah so at some point i i think if it's possible i'd like to uh, read something um not now but at some point before this meeting. oh definitely oh we'll, we'll we'll um we'll have time for you to do that um did I cut you off? You talk? Uh, mm -mm, no. I'll stop okay, you. great. Um, something that you put into my mind uh, two months ago, and it wasn't on the gender and sexuality group. It was actually in our Stop LAPD Spying War on Youth group. And we were talking about um, violence that uh, trans and GNC and queer uh, folks of color that are youth are, are struggling, right? Like. That they're having to stay in homes where they're 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 homo they live with homophobic or transphobic or queerphobic people, and I also think about adults, right? Even trans women who've had to um, go back to their abusive spouses. You know, um, just a few days ago, a few I was on the phone with a, a friend, and he was like, "What's so bad about sheltering in place? I don't get it," and I. I'm gonna be real, I'm gonna chill and keep it real. I'm gonna take off my facilitator hat for a second and say, I got triggered. And I was like, no, you, that's coming from a place of privilege. We can't always think about, we have to also think about those who are like most impacted and who are not able to be safe where they're at, right? Um, I know that um, the trans lifeline has been blowing up lately. There is that, there's Trevor line that's been blowing up as well. And there's all these uh, texting counseling apps that have been like, um, they've been getting a resurgence of like people using them. So I just wanted to put that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Jenna said, um, in what ways has the immig immig immigrant um, community 
left out trans folks and in what ways now that they're that they're at least bringing trans and queer folks and trans women of color to the forefront in the trans in the immigrant movement um the reason we're even part of any conversation in the mainstream immigrants rights movement at the lgbtq rights movement it's because people heavily impacted by oppression have been speaking up, right, that we can longer wait while all these horrible things are happening. But before I go deeper into that, I think it's important for us to really stand in solidarity with the Black community, fighting for Black liberation in a radical Black mm -hmm thinking ideology it, it really inspires me but i also understand that there is so much work to do within our own communities right so i want to yeah. take a moment to you know stand with black folks george floyd i also want to when we hit the streets to think of our black trans woman and tony mcdade who was also gunned down uh, by the Florida police, then we don't hear his name mm. as much of people. And some people are really mobilizing and uplifting his you know, humanity and his dignity because he shouldn't have been gunned down like anyone should have been gunned down by the police. So I'm just, um, you know, wanna send a message of solidarity. And at the same time, thinking of, um, that this moment is really, really shaking and challenging organizing because oftentimes people move in a direction of like what is respectable, what is civil, what makes people comfortable for too long when people are being left out. And that is unacceptable. I think that the work has to be really centered at the grassroots level and make sure that we are uh, reaching out to community. What are the needs? Right now, um, everything is on hold with the migration. I've received calls from members of the community who are really concerned, like what is really going on? Like there are no immigration. It's not really responding to my case, but also I'm like, you know, I was supposed to have a court day in, in this specific day. So I'm just setting some examples of what are, are the really needs of, of what's really happening. But there's still work that needs to be done. And hopefully we are calling, right, the rest of the community to make sure that conversations like the war we're having that are unapologetic that really like you say chela keeps it real because oftentimes our reality doesn't make it to the tables doesn't make it to, doesn't make it to some organizing spaces and that really has to change in order mm. to uh, you know move in a liberation uh, work for all of us you bring a real good point Janice. something that i just saw two nights ago um, was that um, during a protest, mm -hmm. uh, police called in ICE because mm -hmm. a lot of brown folks were showing up, right? I don't remember what state it was. Somebody who knows more about the news can tell me that. But um, just knowing that, just knowing that like police had that, like the audacity to do that during this time when like people are trying to uplift people who are being you know, violently, you know, murdered. Another thing, um, so here's a question and it's kind of related to that. Um, why do we think that we get left out of the conversations? Like, why is it that like, play, uh, like a lot of brown movements haven't had trans and queer centered folk and, and, and even though we're the ones leading the, the movement a lot of the time. And even in Black Lives Matter, which I'll answer that later. But um, yeah, so like, what, how do, why do we think they leave us out of these yeah. conversations? No, that's um, really, that's a, that's a very 
critical question for us to go really, really deep and, mm -hmm. and, and challenge community, right? Challenge spaces. I just want to add to that point of the police, law enforcement, calling in CVP, Customs Border Patrol, immigration official agents to add and further, you know, use violence to, to, to disrupt the protests that are happening across the country. So that is another conversation that oftentimes isn't sort of discussed because the government is moving these strategies outside the main media outlets, but it is happening. There is a photo going around mm -hmm. that there's many, many uh, police and, and ICE agents are being sort of in, this, in a room, given instructions what to do to arrest people. So that has to be also in our conversations as we continue to come up with strategies of resistance and fighting back against the state. I think that that question about why is it so difficult for uh, mainstream organizations of the movement to bring us and center our voices, it has to do with, with the deep uh, homophobia, transphobia, and in the Latinx community, the anti-Blackness that exists within right, our communities. Right now, um, there's, there is some community members who are trying to be divisive and say like, why weren't people out when kids were being in cages? But like in reality, if people were out and a lot of them were black folks fighting against ICE and mm -hmm. abolition, abolition of ICE. And yeah. like, like there, and part of that is like, take a moment, why are you even challenging people out on the streets right now? Like, you can plug in to different organizations, different groups, so you can just do things on your own, but make sure that you move in a direction of, you know, like defunding the police and oh, eventually getting rid of it, right? Because that's not what the communities really need. So, so just having those conversations, and you mentioned about even in our own homes, right? The, the, the rejection of who we are as a person, as a, as a transgender person, it's very difficult for family to accept. They even have a hard time with pronouns and really naming you the name that you connected, that you identify, and that is who you are. So sometimes uh, our homes are not even safe. We are not protected because I believe of the 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 pieces of uh, religion homophobia transphobia and many times people have a hard time joining black lives matter because of the anti-blackness that exists isaac uh, do you have anything to say about that like why are uh why is it so hard to include trans and two-spirit folks in conversations with mainstream movement and mainstream organizations yes um yeah i mean jenisa you said it you know i want to emphasize like homophobia transphobia um you know a deep rooted um uh, misogynistic patriarchal um <laughs> you know just way of of operating and all of it under capitalism all of it under um you know, uh, not deeming trans and gender non-conforming lives as worthy enough to even, to even, um, you know, bring a part in the conversation into center. And I think organizations, groups, collectives need to do so much better. And part of that is dialogue. Like, if you haven't reached out, if, you're, if you haven't reached out to your local trans-led organizations or groups or collectives, and you know you're you're claiming to be trans inclusive like, you know I'm, yes i'm just so many times i'm like what nobody reached out like you know we've been around for 18 years and if you're not reaching out to you know unique women's Polish, all, all the folks who are um you know doing doing the work and have been doing the work for a long time then there's an issue and um i do think that we we have to actually center the voices and actually go make sure that that money is going towards 
these groups and these organizations because um, you know a lot of that is uh, it's tied to money it's tied to like I got my piece of the pie um, you know uh, there's no room for you all you have your own other thing over there and um, it's a lot of just inner inner fighting too I want to say you know it's it's unfortunate um, but I do think that we need to um, really have real conversations and call in. Yes, I'm a big fan of call in. I mean, it's just, that's how I operate. And I, under, I understand call out culture too. But I do think there are different strategies for different people at different times. One thing I'm not gonna do with my, my family that I might not do, you know, with um, someone else who's like this racist, you know, um, person. So I think that, or this homophobic transform person um, who's, you know really being uh, violent towards my community so I do think that there's a lot of work we need to do I think um, uh, yeah that the conversations like you know even on this call one of these calls um, not to call anyone out but there was there was someone I don't know Chella if you remember yeah I was just gonna talk about it go for it go in and I think you had asked you know who um, do you have any trans people working at your organization and you know i have a lot of room and a lot of space for people and and you know <laughs> that's just my nature but and also if um <laughs> the answer to his question his the way he answered it was kind of like i think he was just caught off guard and also like if you don't have trans people at your organization say that and we mm -hmm. can do better you know so i think the first step is like acknowledging that um you're not where you want to be and you know there's a lot of people that are not where, where they want to be. Even within my organization, we are not, or the organization I work with, excuse me, we are not in a, you know, we are not 100%, none of us are. Like, we have a lot of work to do, talking about everything from disability justice to, you know, gender justice to all the things, you know, we, we really need to um, hone in and, and really, really remember that um, our struggles are connected and, if we're not talking about each other's struggle and bringing them into our own work, then what are we doing, you know? And yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned that. I was actually going to talk about that. I wasn't going to say their name or say the org they work with, but I was going to say like that there was a person that came into the gender and sexuality group and they, you know, said some things and then I asked them, you know, like Isaac said, I asked them, um, asked him, like, if they had any trans folks, and they're like, well, we recognize that there's patriarchy and white supremacy, but n not that I can think of. And then, like, you just automatically said, it's, it's not on Twitter, <laughs> but it was like, because they had said, none come to them. And you're like, it's not trans folks' job to come to you. It's y'all's fault. Uh, it's y'all. It's on y'all to go to them mm -hmm. and go to us. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of people don't do that. And so, I'm, you know, I'm not calling out people right now. I will say like BLM specifically for me and a lot of other trans folks in LA that are black have had horrible histories with, with them, right? Not to say, not to attack anyone, not to like verbally or like do that thing. But I will say that we've had, or, you know, but does that mean if I was able-bodied, I wouldn't be out there? Yes, I would definitely be out there right now for George and, and also uplifting Tony McDade's story. Um, but it's just, it's just all the things that y'all both named that like, it, it, and, it, and for me, because I am black and I am trans and I am disabled, it's like those things get gotten. Um, and like, which leads me, and you kind of named it, Isaac, about the intersectional struggle. That was my next question of how can these movements and how can organizations be more intersectional in their, in their movements? Not just by words, right? Because BLM does do that. They'll be like, we need to uplift black trans women. And it's like, where are they in your org, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so let's be real. Um, so how do not just in words, but in action. How can movements be more intersectional? Yeah. No, thank you for mm -hmm. that. And I apologize, our dog was barking and I just wanted to make sure it wasn't in the sound or distracting the conversation. 
Um, but I also want to add one point about not really centering trans voices, undocumented voices, because a lot of the times people are, or organizations are more concerned with access to power than actually changing the structure of power, right? So that it's, that's what I believe that politicians should never be centered or uplift in movement work because they will go into, and, and there's contradictions, right? We all are part of the system. We assimilate in some way and, and, and things like that, but they will, I don't think politicians will, can really lead us in the path to liberation. So then I, I think I, I've been organizing for like over five years now. One of the things that I have learned at the beginning, I felt that we as a group, as an organization could really be, um, like we can really cover a lot of intersectional issues, but the reality is that we cannot, right? Like one single group cannot really carry the weight of so many issues that are impacting us. So I think for us, it's important to know our base, to really listen to our membership to me or members or, or people in the community to work and organize and strategize around the values and principles that the community connects with and, and be sure that we are intentional in building with other communities who are being impacted by uh, oppressive systems, right? So when something comes up, how can we, instead of being reactionary and really having those identities be part of the conversations when you had more time to really listen and you didn't, but this is happening, so now let's, you know, so we have to be very careful, very mindful. How do we position ourselves in moments of, that that need that creates a specific need to mobilize our communities and 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 moving in that direction and also making sure that the work that we have to do as non-black folks is that that we don't take space that we don't speak for the community but we listen and uplift and support the community um, I think we, with the work that we've done, it's been clear that our organization, it's, 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 it's about um, organizing and, 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 and working with undocumented LGBTQ folks, immigrant folks, but we also have some room to do in regard to Black immigrants, right? Because we know that also Afro-Latinx people and, and Black immigrants in general are heavily targeted by the state. Their deportations are also um, a major issue. But again, going back when I started, I was like, why can we run a campaign of a Black immigrant, right? And because I don't think it was, it was for us to lead that work. It was for us to support the work and making yeah. sure that we bring or, 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 collaborate with other groups who are doing that work and make sure that we aligned with them, that we are intentional from the beginning. So that is, that's what I'll share for now. Isaac? Jella, sorry, can you repeat that question? I mean, just kind of uh, continuing on to the, uh, the conversation of just how can um, organizations and collectives be more intersectional, not just by words, right? Because just like that dude, he said, "Oh yeah, we are, we are we acknowledge or whatever, but in action, not really, right?" And same with like I'm gonna be real, BLM. You know, they they say they have trans people. Where are the trans women, right? Um, and so I I, I think um, my question was just um, like, how can we be more intersectional in the movement work that we do? Yeah, um, again, like Jenna said, yes, <laughs> you know, I think that it is, um, it's kind of a, one of the, the, I've been organizing with Gender Justice LA for 10 years now, and I've played different positions <laughs> within the organization, and um, 
you know, I've learned a lot and um, I, I remember just kind of, you know, trying to figure out how I fit in, right? Not thinking that I can be part of this movement. What does an organizer look like? An activist, whatever. Um, and um, I think that there's a way to welcome people and to, to let them know that like, this is not a, a one person leadership uh, situation that many people can lead. And, um, and I think when I started to understand that a little bit more, that my style, even though I don't have this way, I might not speak this way as this person or, um, you know, might not have the language or, you know, whatever it may be, but that my, I'm still valued and my, my, um, my life experience is still um, a part of this movement. And so I think it is, it's so, it's like, not to sound cliche, but it's so beautiful when we have so many different people with different perspectives and like, um, you know, ways of organizing, because we are not all on the same track on the you know, trans organizing tip. <laughs> you know, let me be clear, like in any other community, it is, um, you know, we have different strategies. And I'm one of those people where I think like, as an organizer, we need many different strategies because <laughs> to get to where we need to get to, um, right, liberation, or even just like getting resources for our folks um, as um, in the now, um, I think that, um, you know, it's so important that, you know, we are um, really listening to each other. And I don't think that happens enough. And I will say like, you know, there are a lot of trans people who have a lot of trauma, you know, um, upon trauma. And when we are uh, expecting someone to come into an organization or, you know, you're an LGB organization and you're like, I'm going to hire trans people. And then they're not like, they're not doing exactly what you need or want them or envision them to do um, because they may have not have as much access to, um, you know, certain resources before they got in the door. And so, you know, they'll end up getting fired or whatever. So I think that when we're talking about intersectionality and we're talking about um, bringing folks in, you have to think of different ways to invite people in and not be stuck on, you know, this is the way it is for me. Um, and so, yeah, I just really think that we are, are, a lot of people need to do, and organizations need to do so much better and really um, bring in those folks to lead those, um, those conversations because, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work if you're not, if you're not a native person and you're talking about native rights and issues and um, speaking, up, speaking on um, issues impacting that community um you can be an ally and a comrade but it's not the same um and you really need people from those experiences so yeah yeah um I, my final question um first i i will say something too as well um i think it's um you know there's something to be said for people, for organizations or collectives that try, right? Because um, like you said, no, like Jenna said, said, there's no way to like carry everybody's weight, right? Yeah. Um, even though we want to, there's just no way, right? Um, and so for me, I think, in terms of like even acknowledging that lately I've had to identify as another oppressed community being disabled and mm -hmm. even acknowledging that a lot of these protests right now are not just uh, disabled friendly, right? Um, and like, um, but also like acknowledging that I can carve my own space, right? Um, and so like, I think, I think carving out my own space or letting people carve out their own spaces and figure out what they want to do if they, you know, because if they have the tools, they would be able to do them, you know, and if they knew how to use these tools. Mm -hmm. um, I think you also said something really great, Isaac, around like, not just like the liberation, but also surviving in the moment, right? Well, like, it's great to think about abolishing capitalism, and I and I actually five million percent with that right now we live under a capitalist society where we especially during the covid like sex work is being watched even more 
you know, uh, drug work is even watched even more, like all these different things that people are, have had to do to survive is being watched and criminalized even more. Um, so like we have to survive now, which that brings me to my last question. How, what can people do here that are watching to um, support our work, support trans folks specifically and trans youth, um, as well as like, you know, just uh, support us in other ways. What, what can they do? Anyone can go. Isaac, you want to go? <laughs> um, sure. I was taking a break. <laughs> oh. um, yeah. I mean, I think that there's many ways to support, first and foremost. I mean, always like money and funding is really, really important. Um, you know, um, that is, that is what, so giving to organizations, please follow Gender Justice LA if you're not already. And we post other people's fundraisers. You know, it, it's not like, just give to GGLA. It's really, we have a resource list that's a, a TGI, Transgender Nonconforming Intersect a resource list that has, um, you know, mutual aid on it, who you can donate to. Um, and, and so I think that that's one way. Um, I think also doing your own, um, to like educate your people and yourselves, especially if you're not TGI, um, a TGI person. And you know, I think that that could go a long way. Just having those conversations um, uh, is really, really important. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, support 100% Black trans women um, across the board. Uh, and you know, it doesn't even matter what what the what they're using the money for. Trust trans leadership. Trust Black trans women. Um, and you know, it's not just a slogan or anything like that. Like that's something that I think is really a huge. Um, issue in our um, in our communities, you know, and in, in the world in general. But like, you know, um, so I think that. And then, um, yeah, I think if you're gonna, <laughs> so this happens a lot. So I think with um, trans-led organizations or collectives, like you know, people do the work because they need to and they have to, right? And it's it's part of their survival. Um, and so. If you're not those organizations and you're asking someone to come and speak at a rally or you know um, do some kind of art for them or, or do some kind of labor um, you know uh, I think offering something is really important and so you know really honoring the labor and the emotional labor that goes into creating um, you know it's a lot of freelance are like artists or people on their hustle that just need, um, you know, little little side gigs too are really important. And I think um, if you are thinking like, oh, I have this opportunity, you know, who should I get to to, to do this? And, and you could propose it to, to you know, our community. Um, and I do think with youth, I think um, I think listening it's it's a really huge um, that can go a long ways. Um, and so sharing, sharing stories of young people um, and the issues that they're facing and really bring those to light, especially if you have, you know, a social media platform or whatever. Um, I do think, unfortunately, our, the way things work is like you have, like you have to have someone with a high profile <laughs> to boost your, you know, your work or anything like that. Um, and <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I think that hire young people, uh, listen to them, and also um, give money and educate yourselves. So that's a little snapshot. <laughs> yes. Thank you. That. Yes. Um, I think there are a few things that I want to share. First, if you're new to social justice spaces because of what is happening across the country, I will say for you to take the time to listen to hear what the movement is really saying in this moment. There is a lot of misinformation being spread, especially in social media. So if you're new, like if you have already been part of the movement, if you have been doing some sort of social justice work, also ask yourself, what are the issues that have been left 
out that are not in this conversation and really have those difficult conversations in your circles, right? Like get uncomfortable, get the space uncomfortable sometimes that it's really needed for, for people to acknowledge how like uh, our oppressions are really interconnected by white supremacy and whether you're at home having conversations i've heard in the last few days like how people are really like in some way unconsciously i don't know if it's consciously or subconsciously but they're really aligning with like trans like talking points and i had to sort of challenge that when i feel the urgency to do that right because oftentimes we have to be mindful that we carry so much already and it is very exhausting to really engage in educating people, doing emotional labor, it's really a lot. So that is another thing that people can do, challenge spaces, uh, challenge your, you know, from home to work, to, to, to organizing spaces, and if you have access to power, you know, or, or resources, what, are, what can you do in this moment to make sure that you're uplifting, supporting the work? A lot of people are being arrested across the country in this horrible police state. And we need to get people out immediately, right? People should not be sitting, at, being at risk of COVID-19 being dehumanized because they're um, transgender non-conforming to their intersex. So there's a lot of things that are happening. You can find a way to support. And I think right now the challenge that we all have is to make sure that we um, uplift Black LGBTQ group, you know, groups, Black trans women groups, because they have the potential. They have been doing the work for years, so they they do have powerful voices on leadership too. Okay, so I'm gonna answer this question in less than 30 seconds. Okay, well, less than a minute, because I really do want to hear what Isaac wanted to read. So get that ready, Isaac, while I uh, while I say what I need to say. As a black trans woman, when you see people's PayPal's, give to them. If you can't give share it right and if you're not online and if you have a friend that you know is struggling that's trans women of color are black and trans give the money right um i loved what Isaac said about supporting art guess what i'm in an all trans funk band um so support our work right if you want to know the the name i will send i will write it down on the thing later um there's other ways to support as well, like make sure that you invite us to conversations and that it's safe for us, right? Make sure that we, um, if we're doing a Zoom call, that we're able to be, that there's not gonna be any Zoom bombing, right? Um, all these different things, right? Um, and I echo what Genesette and Isaac said, and just support us. Um, and, you know, Gender Justice LA, I'm also part of that. So like I give them money, <laughs> it's real talk. Um, and Trans Latina Coalition, I believe in the work they do. And La Familia, I believe in the work they do. So like, yes, whenever y'all see those names, repost if you're online. If you're not, you know, um, well just listen. <laughs> yeah, um, are you ready, Zach? Yep. Yeah, okay. thanks for that, Chella. Um, yeah, I think I also just want to say, um, like, the thing that I, I tell people is ask what you could do for the trans community, not what the trans community can do for you. I think really thinking about that and sticking with that, um, because I'm just like, I, I have a lot of rolled eyes um, when every time someone asks, like, can you all do this? Like, no connection, nothing, just, you know, asking what can you do? Um, so, yeah, build that trust in that relationship. Um, so I wanted to just uh i came across this and folks may know this um uh and uh trigger warning um there was a uh a black trans woman um who was killed and um her name is nina pops um 
And if other folks know more information um, than I do, you know, please share. Uh, but I came across this post, um, and this was by um, uh, Charlene, who did the, who's the author of Unapologetic, a Black Queer and Trans, excuse me, a Black Queer and Feminist Mandate for Radical Movements. Um, and she wrote a little poem, or, or a poem, um, in honor of Nina Pops. And so here it is. I thought it was beautiful, and, and um, I didn't know her, so I didn't ask permission, but it's online. Um, so for Nina, um, each time a sister is killed and not enough, know or care to say her name, remember, this land is big enough, the internet is wide enough, there are enough words to petition and post. And still, imagination and will is too small to ring, shout and demand injustice for Nina Pop. Perhaps that is because such justice is inside and outside work. My people, Nina Pop is our business. She deserves more. Art calls to action, love, and rage. Uh, say her name, Nina Pop. Ashe. Ashe. <sighs> All right. Amit, oh. do you want to? Sure, Chilab. Thank you so much, and thank you for for really grounding us all in this conversation, Janiset and Isaac and Chilla. Uh, a few uh, questions and comments came up, so let's just uh, get to those first. Um, so, and then the, well, going right away, anyway, we can share the names of the organizations you recommend here, please. So, of course, it's uh, Gender Justice LA, and we'll post those too. Uh, GGLA and then uh, uh, Amelia TQLM um, and uh, uh, and and what is the the the, the website for both uh, Jenny said what's the website? Um, it's familiatqlm.org. Familiatqlm.org and Isaac. Um, we are um, Gender Justice LA. It's little a nation builder website. So if anyone has another way people can support is if you have. Um, Website skills. <laughs> it does that. Nice. Uh, of course, all resources. Uh, and Chella, the name of the band folks wanted to know? Oh, okay. So um, I will write it down actually for y'all. Let me chat it for y'all in okay. to the chat. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, also uh, earlier in the in the conversation, uh, Chella, you were you were trying to remember the name. Their name is uh, Liana uh, Dior. L Y A N N A and then D I O R. Um, and then, um, uh, Isaac, a question was you made a comment like, what is call in, call out? <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if it's old school or new school, <laughs> um, but it's the way that I was taught around um, uh, for me, for me. So, calling in is really, these are like your people, right? Your comrades. Um, and calling them in because sometimes when you so when you call them in that means to um, to really use a strategy that doesn't push people away um, necessarily versus calling out if I you know were to call out of a, a comrade and um, sometimes that could that could uh, bring take people uh, not that can make folks or folks can what comes up for people is that they you know don't feel like they can. Um, be engaged in the conversation and so you've lost them already you know instead of um calling them in and which for me is a more um uh for me a gentler uh way to to build community and trust and and um and also i understand uh you know to call out like people call out there's a call out culture on social media um, it's a high anxiety thing for a lot of people that further isolates our folks. And so um, it's not a strategy that I think necessarily uh, works with your comrades. And all that to say, call out is really needed and necessary for um, violent, um, my perspective, violent um, um, actions that are, that are taken from, from community or even people in your, in your life, right? So it might be a comrade. Um, so I try to do the call in first before um, uh, really going to any kind of extreme, and that's just for me personally. So I, I've uh, somebody posted. Uh, I'm not going to take their name. An extreme uh, <laughs> way to look at it, and says, "You guys suck really hard. Shut the fuck up. Thanks." So that's a oh call no, in no, call. no, that's the band. That's my band. 
<laughs> Honey. Oh. That's the okay. band name. Classic. Oh, that's that, that's it. Okay, that's sorry, Jenna, I didn't know that. Oh, so it was like you guys suck really hard. Shut the fuck up. Thanks. That's the name of the band. Yeah, yeah, awesome. you did. No, I I thought that was a call in call out. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, Elephant. I mean, it is kind of. It's it very much a call exactly. out. But uh, but yeah, <laughs> but, but I love <laughs> <that's the> name. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that thing. Another question that uh, came up, and I know, Chella, earlier on in the conversation, you had uh, uh, addressed that, and Jenna said, and, and, um, and Isaac addressed that too. But just uh, the folks who've been who dialed in, they were like, I'm, I'm new to this. So I just wanted to know in what ways has Pride Celebration been inaccessible for the trans community? Um, does anybody want to go? Do you want to go, Isaac or Genesette? All in, call out. <laughs> okay, fine. Making it making it so that it's twenty dollars to get in. Well, first it was twenty. Now it was like what? How much was it last year? Some shit. I don't even know. I don't. Yeah. I don't even know. So, so like making it like that. Number two, having cops come and be a part of the parade, because especially thinking of the history of Pride, the first Pride was a riot against police, right? that was started by women of color, trans women of color, Sylvia Rivera and Marcia B. Johnson. Mm -hmm. So we got to think about that. So it's like, it's forgotten the history or the history therefore. Uh, so those are two things I could think mainly. Number three, it's been more uh, capitalized. Mm -hmm. So like Budweiser buys into it and like it's stationed all over the place. Different food places are there and they're selling foods for like, $20 a pop, you know, whereas like trans women of color specifically, where you gonna get the money, you know what I mean? Um, it And it's specifically in Hollywood, it's super white, just being honest. Whereas like Long Beach, it's more people of color. Um, Long Beach is super white. Um, I, but I think the first two things are not, like are the things that have been done nationally. Um, it's just a way for a lot of groups to make a buck. Yeah. Um, what uh? Does anyone want to add anything else? I would just add that even the process of having floats in the parade, like you need to fill out an application. Sometimes you have to pay the fee, and I was like, and it's it's always sort of like corporations are take the space, right? Because they just want your business. They don't want to get you out of a detention center. They don't want to get people out of prisons. They don't want to get people out of jail. They just want your money and they're happy with the status quo. And that's that's not okay for us. Definitely. I'll just add that, you know, it is super inaccessible in terms of like, um, uh, you know, for able to able-bodied um, festival that happens and, you know, it's, it's not accessible for a lot of folks who um, can't do tons of walking or even, mm -hmm. um, you know, getting from A to B. I know the West Hollywood one is, um, is pretty uh, inaccessible. I mean, they're all pretty inaccessible. I think yeah. I, I will say that I, I do do work with Indigenous Pride LA and it's more of a, um, uh, there's no alcohol that one. And it's like, it's more of cult it's cultural heritage, um, Indigenous folks. And so, uh, and it's a celebration. So, um, yeah, but I do think in terms of, um, yeah, it's all about money. It's all about, um, you know, they, they're, they're not going to show up for, you know, getting youth out of uh, jail or, you know, any other issues that our communities face um, because it's just about, it's about money and it's about capital and it's really, yeah. it, it makes me really sick. Um, and also, I understand, um, like that was one of my, like I said earlier, I was one of my first hustle spaces. I sold those bracelets. I, I made, you know, I made a couple of hundred dollars as a young person, um, you know, because it was inaccessible and I would sneak in and get all my friends in and get all the, um, you know, the, the beer tickets or whatever and um, replicate them. And, you know, I was kind of hustling that system, but it, it has always been inaccessible for a lot of folks, um, especially. I, sorry. I also wanted to add that, like, I know I want to say either New York or the Bay, um, around three years ago or four years ago, 
uh, a lot of queer and trans black folks were um, trying to march through pride and their pride wouldn't let them. So like their pride, like called the police on them and shit. So like, you know, they're very pro cop, very pro like capitalism, very pro all these things that we actually say that we're against. So yeah, mm-hmm. that's what makes it not Thank accessible you. in my eyes. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was super helpful. Uh, so there is a, uh, let me just, uh, this came through text, um, the question, and I will uh, thank you folks for, for, so I'll remind folks that now we're in this uh, collective conversation uh, period, so please either post your question in the chat room or raise your hand, there's that uh, opportunity as well, uh, or text us at 562-230-4578. Um, and this came as a text, uh, folks, so it says this, that the context this evening has been gender and sexuality, um, mainly to do with surveillance, and that's uh, the coalition's work. Uh, I'm diverting a little bit from that. Given the present scenario of a virus going around and the new normal of physical distancing, um, uh, uh, so in the backdrop of COVID-19, as well as the uprising, along with businesses opening up, is there a conversation around how to navigate such socialization, especially fulfilling sexual behaviors? Um, I can say one thing that I saw that was pretty amazing. Um, it was kind of like a kink party, um, Zoom kink party. And I think it was, it looked, I, I would, I think it was very queer and trans. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that that's one way, like, you know, we're, we're continuing to find ways um, uh, to to connect with each other um and also there's you know there's there's also people are still social distancing meeting in the parks i mean it is that's very real there's less people out i I was just going to say that people are i know some people that are still hooking up you know um Mm -hmm. um i mean that this question yeah i don't know how to answer it besides (laughs) that that Thank you. Genesis, any comments? No. Oh. <laughs> All right, yeah. folks, so it's time to open up and uh, just uh, any questions, any comments. Um, so, so uh, you know, let's just, uh, I have a question, and uh, uh, and this is something that, uh, Genesis, uh, you and I have had uh, conversations in the past as well, and particularly in this moment of uprising, why it becomes so crucial, too. Mm-hmm. Um, that within the, and having been involved also in the immigrant rights movement for many, many, many years, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a certain level of chauvinism in the, at least what we saw in the immigrant rights movement as well, where the, for the longest time, that was a lack of understanding of the criminal justice system mm-hmm. and was not really even paid attention to, and it became more of a privileged kind of a fight of an adjustment of status. Do you know what I'm saying? So where, uh, uh, and now we hear about crimmigration all the time, whereas Mm -hmm. the experience, particularly in the black and indigenous community has always been uh, around, around police, around the criminalization of the body, around contact with law enforcement agencies. So in a sense, on one hand, there was a claim about adjustment of status, but but then all, it started also building towards this criminal piece as well. So I think that there was this failure to recognize that criminal justice system, that adjustment of status and CBP and ICE and immigration are all a part of the criminal justice system, mm-hmm. right? And it just became this thing that, you know, no, I'm not a criminal and this is where I'm going and this is where the anti-blackness comes in. Like, you know, I mean, that, that they have to deal with the criminal justice system. I am not dealing, I'm just seeking an adjustment of my status from being undocumented to being documented. So, so I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I just wanted to see that uh, any, any, has that shift or uh, has that been challenged within the movements as well? Um, I think it's slowly being challenged. Um, part of the work that we have to commit is political education and through that piece I think it's important 
to have an understanding on what was the function of the police in the very first place. Why was the police or law enforcement, you know, formed, right? So then we also look at the immigration, the whole DHS under 9-11. So I think it's like having those conversations, having access to that history, it's really important. And that once you get that information out there to the community, that we don't let the narrative of the mainstream saying, yeah, these people are, are doing bad, get them in, in jail, get them in prisons, or, you know, we, we're the good versus bad immigrant, right? So I think in the last few years, we're, because voices are taking that space, because, like having really this conversation, it's really, really important. We have DACA coming up. Uh, in the next few weeks where the Supreme Court is going to make the decision. And a lot of people credit the government and it wasn't the government or the Obama administration that gave that to the, it was, it was people putting their bodies on the line. It was um, people doing acts of civil disobedience, getting arrested, right? And in the end, this is what they received, but it wasn't the end goal for what I understand. It was just like one, one step into moving in the direction of ending the criminalization of our communities. So it's, 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 there, there's been a shift in that, but still, you know, dominates. And, and we also have to really, on top of political education, understand like, um, do you want to assimilate? Do you want to fight for assimilation versus liberation? Because assimilation will continue to have this uh, division among even our, our own people, our own groups. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because I think one of the things that um, um, on a personal level as an immigrant rights uh, movement, that the the underlying theme is and it's almost like and i hate to use this word almost a, a, a disease of, 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 of privileged that where it's the assumption of privilege of not being black and and in that sense like you know claiming based on that assumption that i'm not that and i'm just like you know so why why can't i adjust my status so i i, I just wanted to like you know just as we are, as we are unpacking it um, but on the flip side, and this is something, I don't know, Chella, if uh, uh, you'd be open to, to taking this question, like there's also this, this at times um, around the national security police state, although, you know, of course, it's impacted black, black communities for the longest time, but mostly post 9-11, talking to comrades and colleagues in black liberation movement, there was not enough attention paid that how the immigrant body was being experimented with these national security laws and how, you know, the, the, the so in a sense where in, in the experimentation on the immigrant body with national security laws were then seeping into domestic policing and becoming the day-to-day -day policing as well, which in turn would come back and impact the black community in the long run, for example, predictive policing and suspicious activity reporting and various other programs. So any, any thoughts on that, Chella? I don't, I don't wanna. Uh... Um, I, think, I think in terms of like acknowledging um, that with, anti with, with black folks, there is um, this overwhelming like non-understanding that like, just like there's like the good immigrant versus bad immigrant, there's the good person of color versus the bad, bad person of color thing too, right? Um, there's also the everybody against black, right? Um, even um, if you're, you know, someone who's from a certain country in, in Africa that's been taken over by Arabic, you know, a lot of folks will be like, oh, that's not black, so we shouldn't care about them. Mm -hmm. And so I think the only thing I can say about that and about what you've named is that we, folks don't watch trends, right? A lot of folks are not looking at trends because it doesn't affect them. Like a lot of people are not, a lot of people aren't in the street because they don't think the police is affecting them right now either. Like even some of my neighbors, right? Um, so I think 
I think in terms of like when folks see that like this is all tied into like how like the state's going to treat the lowest of the low, you know, which are black folks, right? Um, in America specifically. Um, so like, um, how do we, you know, we just got to, I, I liked what Genesis said about political education um, and just like, you know, learning these ways so that we can combat it. That's all I can say about that, Baba. I mean, how Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, and these are questions also like, you know, they're uh, open to our, our, our other participants as well, that please feel free because, uh, you know, just uh, we, this is we're building collective knowledge and, and collective power as well. Um, so a question uh, is that how do we uh, keep making sure queer and trans folks are included in the mainstream narratives and movements for black lives and against police? I know partially you've been answering that, but yeah. So how do we keep making sure queer and trans folks are included in the mainstream narratives and movements for black lives and against police? Anybody? I think saying the names of black trans women, I think sharing not just our pain, right? Especially, there's this whole thing about, especially for black folks, we see these videos that have come out of like trauma. And so like when it comes to black trans women, right? We see it, we see it doubled um, because we see black trans women who are also getting attacked in some of these videos. And like, so like not just sharing those stories, which you're more than welcome to share the story, but not the video or the photo because that's just playing on trauma, right? Uh, I think also sharing our joys, sharing our art, sharing our music, sharing, including us in conversations, and not have us as, as an afterthought either, right? A lot of the times people have us as, as an afterthought, and that shit is fuck, like, like, sorry, that's, that's shady, right? Um, if you really mean all Black lives, mean it, and be like, we have to have trans women in our conversation, we have to have queer Black folks in our conversation. We have to have disabled folks in our conversation, you know, because at the end of the day, it, we we got to work from our, our the bottom up, you know what I mean? Um, and so, yeah, that's that's what I think. If anyone wants to chime in, mm -hmm. Janice or Isa, I just want to add, like, to stop killing us in the first place right because in the last in the last few years we've seen a high number of cases specifically black trans women and if you don't believe me google and then you'll see the names of black trans women being murdered so acknowledge that that exists and that we as people have every right to be existing, right? And give us an opportunity to like, to listen to us. And when you start learning and when you start coming around people, then you will answer your own question, right? Like, what is it that I need to do? Sometimes it gets really exhausting when people tell us like, what can we, you know, what can we do for you? Like. Like Issa said, what can they do for us, you know? So like, take the initiative. Don't wait until someone, in, in a certain group or, or identity come to you and tell you what needs to be done. But we're still in this together. We have a lot of work to do, but I, I'm hoping that in the next, you know, the next generation of activists, fighters, freedom fighters, organizers will really take us to liberation. <laughs> I mean, can I add to that? Please, please. Um, I'll just say, like, yeah, Jennifer, <laughs> always. Um, you know, I have so much love for you and for Chella and, and um, appreciate it, um, what, you, what you're saying. Um, how many, I, I want to say, like, thank you for, like, you know, having trans people, um, you know, having, leading these conversations. And, um, you know, we met maybe, like, I don't know, over five years ago, and you came to a trans, um, we were having, like, a, an event. 
And I was like, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> and, um, and I'm still here. I'm still connected to the work, um, you know, and, you know, we've done so many different things with Stop LAP Spying. And um, that has been a relationship that has been built over time. And so I think really not, um, you know, having trans people or TGI people come to you. I mean, when people come to my office, I sit down, I talk with them. And, you know, we start to be like, you know, have a conversation. And those are the people that I know, if you're seeking us out, if you're seeking the issues um, that are facing the trans community, then that's the beginning part to build trust. And then if you also give us grants and money, and that's like, you know, also another way that, um, you know, it's like, okay, now we can do the work and we can give, we can give folks money because we pay our folks um, most of the time. I mean, when we have money, we, we pay our folks and there are some people who opt out of out of um uh receiving funds but you know it's really important that we are offering something um even as a grassroots translator organization so yeah that's that. great thank you uh folks uh any more comments please keep on coming uh uh and, and questions and all raise your hand or just uh put, put them in the uh, in the chat box um, there was a question, uh, just as, uh, and Jenna said, maybe if uh, you can take a shot at it, that could you explain what crimigration means? I think crimigration is, I think it's, the, it's like the criminal justice systems and the connections with like immigration, right? How for many undocumented people who have been living in this country, um, like having a contact with the police is the connection to get them deported, right? So sometimes there's been collaborations with police and, and immigration. Uh, in California, there was the 287G bill that a lot of organ some organizations, immigrants' rights were fighting against because it was allowing, giving them more power to to collaborate with ICE, right? So I think that was also, it was brought up in the very successful uh, documentary 13 by a uh, Ava DuVernay, where in a very small window, she makes those connections and with mass incarceration and immigration detention facilities. And I think that it's another uh, entry point of organizing and how do we make these connections and, and build a stronger movement. Great, thank you. Uh, and just a, a little bit, um, um, and here I'm gonna age, my, age myself. So, um, so the 287G uh, clause was part of the 1996 uh, Clinton-Ira bill as a federal legislation. Um, which allowed uh, uh, local law enforcement and immigration authorities to partner up and for local law enforcement to act as immigration agents or for contracts and various things. So that really became a major, um, almost a weapon, how it was, was weaponized. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Janice. Said. Um, okay, folks, uh, any, anybody else has any comment or questions or anybody? Uh, we can try to unmute all, but uh, if both folks promise that they will immediately mute themselves if they don't want to make a statement. So I'm going to try it once. Hi, <laughs> Jenny There you go. Okay. Okay, now, so there's a whole lot of, uh, so uh, from, uh, I'm, going start, I'm going to start muting people if they don't unmute themselves. So I did unmute. Any any comments? Any questions from folks? Is I will have a whole set of questions. I'll keep on because I'm just okay. So um, let's uh, and you know. So we're going through. Uh, I mean, this is not just time of COVID, but also time of uprising as well. Um, and then, um, and also, um, hold on a second. Let me just see. Somebody just has a comment. Let me just go to you, Dinah. Oh, there you are. Oops. There you are. Okay. Maybe let me just go ahead. Can you, can you hear me? Any of y'all's orgs? Elite, 
interview in regards to like the food not um, how they're organizing around folks that are getting um, um, yeah, right. out of housing. Okay, so I probably would have to mute everybody and then come back again um, because it seems like this is not really working really well. But I think the question is, um, uh, let me just, uh, try to mute that. And mute. Okay, uh, so I'm going to just uh, go ahead and then unmute folks. So the question is, are any of y'all's orgs doing any work with the LA Tenants Union and the Food Not Rent movement? Um, so uh, Chela, you're going to be unmuting yourself. Isaac, you can be unmuting yourself. You are unmuted. And let me just see, Janice said, there you are, unmuted. So uh, are any of y'all doing any work with the LA Tenants Union and the Food Not Rent uh, movement? Um, no, I, um, it, it's funny because I did reach out. Um, so that's, I'm not gonna say their name, but that's what the person's collective that they were with that that said that they had like they acknowledged that there's you know transphobia out there and they were like oh yeah we work with trans folks and then I challenged them and they're like oh we don't have any trans folks in our in our org right um I have reached out um they've responded so it's not like they haven't responded it's just I'm kind of like you're at capacity but I yeah I haven't yeah, I have it. Anyone else? He's out clear. Dennis it? No, I mean, we haven't as an organization. Um, uh, I did uh, uh, support a, a fellow, uh, a friend who um, was making a film. Um, so I think it's on that site um, uh, around, um, you know, uh, canceling rent. So uh, but that was just a personal thing. Um, we haven't we haven't worked with them um, in real concrete ways. Um, but if you're out there, hit us up. Um, we're always willing to start a conversation, and that's how we build in trans people into into the work. So, um, so there's a question here. Uh, as so it says that uh, I have a question regarding ICE or Homeland Security present in protests. Uh, right now. So what is the correct way to spread information without in, uh, inciting fear uh, to the undocumented community? And what is the role of Homeland Security at this time during protests? So it's a two, two part question about uh, spreading information without uh, inciting fear. Um, yeah, I it's really concerning and alarming that again, like the picture that is going around and collaborating because on top of, of arresting people for protesting now ICE is present. So we wanna make sure that the community who wants to stand in solidarity and wanna be out there, um, don't hold back from going, but they just have to make sure that the the in some way they reach out to local groups and organizations who are organizing to make sure like if it's safe to show up do they have legal observers do they have any support if people if the police were to arrest people and then they're undocumented and be, get turned over to eyes do they have any support? Like, do not make sure you don't sign any documentation, especially if it's your like self deportation and things like that. Because we know this administration, it's on track of like deporting people, right, and threatening people and having us living in fear. So just be very mindful of anyone who wants to get be out there and make sure you uh, my best advice or is to to connect with local groups that are doing an organizing a protest and they can give you the best information. And uh, the role of uh, Homeland Security at this time during protests? Um, is to, to, to like 
continue to target communities who have been vulnerable in, in, in many, many years, right? Obviously, uh, the, the administration run under openly attacking uh, immigrants. So they just want to, like, they see the massive number of people and, and, and they just don't want to increase that numbers, right? So they want to use to those tactics. So they want to, like, have meetings, have people in uniforms with CBP. So especially major cities, people are, are coming out in large numbers. So I think these are just, like, scary tactics that they're using, but we shouldn't let the state, you know, keep us keep us when people when they want to be out there uh, resisting mm -hmm. and also just to add to that too of course like looking at the stalker state and the architectures of surveillance uh, that homeland security becomes a central uh, multi-agency task force coordinator um, where uh, in a sense where you would have the FBI um, of course, from the Department of Justice, you would have uh, other agencies, IC, uh, uh, ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, uh, Customs and Border Patrol. So these are also central parts of a lot of information sharing that happens amongst these agencies. Um, they already are, like for example, one small example yesterday, um, the LAPD announced that they are going to be monitoring all the videos uh, in partnership with the FBI and, and, and gather, um, uh, you know, the, the information and then they'll be deploying various other tools, whether it's facial recognition. Um, and they have been doing that. They have been doing that, you know, if uh, folks uh, remember the, some of the previous uh, large, um, particularly, you know, the one in Baltimore that, that had happened and, you know, these movements. So a lot of uh, Homeland Security is very central um, and, and I think from our vantage point also, um, like to cut through a lot of stuff that, you know, rather than the structural piece, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, look at law enforcement as counterinsurgency forces, because these are occupying armies. I mean, you know, just uh, talk to folks in the, in the neighborhoods and the communities. So in that, there's a lot of information sharing and, and, and uh, both domestically, locally, regionally, and internationally as well. Um, so there's also, so then a comment is that when black, trans, queer, and immigrant folks are part of this conversation, we start to understand how policing works, how it falls on certain bodies and how criminalization works. Like uh, folks are saying right now, this conversation is so rich because Janiset, Isaac, Jella have always shared the very many ways in which police, immigration, enforcement, CBP target customers and border patrol communities who are who are multiply marginalized. I, th I thank Stop LAPD Spying Coalition for consistently lifting up these issues. Well, thank you. Um, and also, as we saw after the 1992 uprising in LA, more than 1,000 immigrants were arrested and deported by then the INS. Mm -hmm. So, so now, of course, like you know, we're looking at almost 30 years later. Uh, coming around full circle, so of course we will see ice on the streets. Um, any, any. So it's of course like going back to not a moment in time, but a continuation of history. That is yeah, yeah. DHS is a really dangerous uh, group that has to be abolished as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, just a question for all three of you to to take a moment as uh, and the and the comment emotional labor came up. Mm. Um, and the, the, the almost like uh, a commodification of people's stories almost mm. like, you know, in a sense where constantly, for, so, so uh, could you all maybe just talk about that a little bit more? Can I go first? Look, Chella, of course. Um, I think for me, it's, um, uh, it's always having to explain things, right? Like as a black trans, disabled woman. There are times when I, I post stuff on my Facebook and I I want people to see it and not necessarily disagree. I mean, not necessarily agree, but just know that that's what I'm feeling or that's what I'm going through because of my identities. A lot of the times I have to explain, like even with like in real life, right? Like 
when I'm talking to somebody who's a cisgender black man and they don't get that um, as a black trans woman, I, I hate the term more marginalized, but that I am marginalized, you know, even with our, in our culture. Um, and sometimes, sometimes I'm okay to do the, the, the labor because it's work, you know, it's work for me to, even as a non, as a disabled person, it's work for me to like, think about these, these terms that we use and these words and even break them down. Right. Um, and it's work for me to be like, yo, like you have to listen and sometimes not, not be, it be reciprocated that they're listening to me when I'm, I am hearing them out, especially if they're a black man, right? Or if they're a part of an oppressed community. Um, I think there's always this, there's this thing, especially with women about free labor, like they're always assumed to have to do labor for free, right? And so like, especially black women, right? Um, and it's and, and it's tiring. It's it's very tiring. Um, I I, I want to say one more anecdotal story was I went to the gift conference, which was uh, for nonprofit uh, fundraising, and um, I remember that we decided to do a black queer caucus, a black trans queer caucus, and this uh, cis black woman came through and um and like somebody said oh something about cisgender and she was like what's cisgender and i was about to open my mouth and explain it to her and and the facilitator was like yo hope hope that thought i'm gonna give you my rates i'm gonna give you my my time that i can talk <laughs> about it because at the end of the day i gotta eat nice you know what i mean don't be giving people out those nuggets for free when they can actually Google some of this shit, right? Yeah. So like, but I, I do believe in each one, teach one, and I do believe in building up the community. But I also like, just by surviving, I'm educating y'all. So like, that's real. The end. <laughs> you understand, Isaac? Yeah, no, I just want to add that, like, it, you know, Chella mentioned trauma porn, and I think sometimes the system, the media wants to show the most, you know, pain that our communities had to endure for the white gates, right? For like consumption and, and, and we have to be really careful. We have to be critical of how are, how is the system using that trauma to to like uphold the system, right? Um, I went, I've been through immigration courts where people, like undocumented people, cannot legally change their name, so they have to, in 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 many ways, through their documentation, be misgendered by the judges, by the mm -hmm. attorneys, and it's getting better because, in a way that people are really challenging and like do not name these persons with their legal name, but their name that they identify, right? So it's, it's really, it's really important to think about emotional labor and, and how is that benefiting the status quo? I, I remember when I started speaking, I went to this interview in LA and I, I was there at the studio. It was this radio studio and all the people were white. And I was just speaking my mind, telling them to, you know, speaking my truth and, 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 think, and they never aired that interview. And then I ran, it's interesting because I, I ran into this white trans woman at an event a few years later and I didn't even like, so much has happened since then. And, and then she just came to me thinking that ah, she was being sympathetic. And then she's like, Jenny said, I'm sorry. I just want to tell you that 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 interview was never air. And but I have a copy. I'll find a way to get it to you. And I was like, OK, whatever, you know, so it's just like it's it's 
it's, it's like we have to be careful that we don't focus so much on the pain, but we also, you know, showcase the, the complexity, the nuances of our experiences mm -hmm. and how so many people don't want to like, you know, change the immigration status. Some people don't want to take hormones. Some people don't want any surgery. Some people, you know, so there's a lot more, a lot of pieces but this system loves to hear our pain and then like like have a happy ending, like a fairy tale, and that is not the reality for many members of the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. Um, Isaac? Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just share that. You know, I think with, um, like the world needs to change. <laughs> and I think that, um, it shouldn't be on us. I mean, everything everyone's already saying, I think, is really important and impactful. Um, I really think that um, it is, it is every day in in every day, um, wherever you move through the world, you're experiencing these, um, uh, you know, microaggressions or whatever. And then on top of that, if you're a trans woman, you're femme-identified, non-binary person, and um, um, and so I do think that there's, uh, it takes its toll. And, you know, as someone who's been doing work in this community for a long time, LA's my home on Tonga land. I'm really, you know, I've, I've been organizing here since I was a kid and, uh, or since I was a young person. And I do think that there's, as I've come into my identity, I've, I've come through, you know, different, different ways of understanding myself. And so I think, it's really important to understand that we're, we're we all have different experiences and um and i think that that's the labor of, of talking to people about our story all the time and just even being misgendered for some folks um i think um miss major is a really great example a black trans um, woman who is an elder and you know she i remember her talking about um she changed her name this is out there some public stuff she changed her name um, to her chosen name, and then uh, and then changed it back because she didn't want to. You know, she really didn't want to uh, uh, conform to what the state wanted her to to conform to her ID, right? Um, and so that story really stuck with me and is impactful. Um, but yeah, going back to the labor part, I think do a lot of the own your own education um, before you ask a trans person um, I think that's just like the culture needs to really shift on a on a like uh, major level mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay cool um, so I'm just looking at stuff uh, well this could also be both uh, can be linked together too um, so um, I know Chella had had raised this uh, this this question earlier around uh, COVID. Um, so the additional issues, like of course, like this is also time of COVID and an uprising as well. But along with that uprising is the is a heavy-handed uh, state apparatus that is in play too. I mean, there are these threats of Insurrection Act and all that, whatever it takes. So, so how uh, are the, uh, uh, is, is the trans community now um, looking at number one, um, like, you know, just where Jenna said you were sharing examples of a complete failure of access to healthcare in New York and other places. Um, but then we have this uprising going on too. So what kind of conversations are sort of right now, one about self-defense, of course, um, you know, secondly, about getting access to resources, um, thirdly, with this, uh, with the threat of a pandemic out there as well. So any, any thoughts on that? Like, uh, what is this, some of the, and then I think I, I would just add to this question myself, like, you know, so how can this be again, as Jella was lifting intersectional, in nature that how do we bring other communities into the fold into this conversation as well anybody <laughs> i i think that in moments of crisis there are opportunities right for organizing for get creative come up with new strategies and how do we hold everything how do we move through all the stress that we already have to deal with in life 
as we are witnessing the uprising, as we are seeing how the state is violently reacting to it, um, also, what are some meaningful ways that you can, like if you are able and willing to go to a rally in any specific part of the country, hopefully this conversation will challenge you to think like why they didn't, they didn't bring you know the, this specific struggle right and making those connections with the community and um i think people need to really also pay attention that on top of everything that you mentioned that we're dealing with as a community there's also a lot of challenges like i mentioned access to healthcare. we have a case coming out in the supreme or specifically in relation to sexuality and gender identity, if employers have the right to fire people. So this is gonna have bigger implications than just the trans or LGBT community, right? And they're basing their argument on religious beliefs. So if they start with us, then they're gonna go after any other group that doesn't align with why evangelism or catholicism and and they're gonna start targeting people and and just you know this is gonna go beyond just the community that it is on on record so just be aware of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh chela isaac do you all have any thoughts about that go ahead isaac um no i think i was just listening cool <laughs> Thank you. Jella, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I don't have any thoughts about okay. it. Okay. Okay. I mean, I think one of the things that the takeaway that I'm, uh, at least I'm taking uh, from uh, Genesette's comment is that, you know, uh, that as people who are engaged, and I, and I do feel, and I, in a sense, like, you know, that as organizers, we are also in a very privileged space as well. We have the privilege of access to information, to knowledge, to other folks, and of course, like, you know, just constantly building communities too, like this, this whole process that we are doing. So then I think it's also incumbent upon us that we, we are obligated, and I think this is a decolonization of our mind comes in, that we are obligated to be constantly having that situational awareness. That, that what sort of conditions are being created. So Jenna said to your point, what I'm thinking is like the conditions are now being created even through major legal action, like at the highest levels from the Supreme Court mm -hmm. to dehumanize people uh, mm -hmm. that they cannot be employed to give the right to people to fire them at will because of their, their, their them about their issues around sexuality. So how is this current moment where this uprising is going? How are we bringing, and what is the opportunity here to raise that awareness and, and engage in deeper political education uh, in our communities as well? So, I, so that's, that's at least my takeaway um, from Genesis, your, your comment. So, so yeah, most definitely, most definitely, so yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you know, I have a, a question from last time uh, that somebody had raised, and I just I just had made a note for myself. So this is something I'm kind of good digging in, and we have just about ten minutes left to, for this uh, webinar. Um, that in COVID nineteen, um, you know, people have used the example of for contact tracing and surveillance, um, uh, various types of it around the HIV uh, pandemic as well. Right. Um, and so in a sense, uh, uh, you know, just just so now, of course, that surveillance state is, is expanding. Um, and and, I, and I'm looking at my notes. I don't know if I took the, the comments uh, correctly or not, because it was both about a pushback around that contact tracing, which would lead to further demonization of the community. Um, at that time, and the political activism of groups like ACT UP was brought up in this conversation. So, so I just wanted to uh, sort of, in, th in this moment now, several, like we are in another pandemic, um, contact tracing is a tool that gets weaponized, and particularly living in a stalker state, in a, in a patriarchal, white supremacist, settler colonial state, 
how do you you feel that how gender um, and sexuality and these identities how they can get further uh, both pathologized, demonized, and criminalized as a result of these measures supposedly to preserve the health of the community under the guise of that. Yeah. Any thoughts? <laughs> hmm. Repeat the question. So contact trace of, of a, this was a long way question. I'll keep it simple. So the contact tracing piece, which basically seeks out people who have been, uh, who have symptoms affected. who are positive are affected uh, mm -hmm. to then seek out and, and see that the, to prevent further, uh, uh, you know, spread. But that becomes a tool for data collection. That becomes a tool for surveillance. Yes. That becomes a tool for many different levels to further uh, pathologize and demonize the, certain communities as well. Right, and we see that very much happening, particularly, you know, uh, Chella in the black community as they talk about well, there's there's uh, susceptibility, there's predisposition, there's this, there's that. So mm -hmm. that whole demonization is is has already begun. So how within the the uh, TGI community, uh, the transgender non-conforming intersex community, how is that? Uh, are there conversations around that happening? So um, there is, actually isn't a lot of conversations that I have heard or been a part of um, other than here. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think that it just further is police, it will further um, demonize and police uh, TGI bodies. You know, I think it's, um, you know, the, the, um, the amount of violence that then can continue and be even raised um, based on uh, you know, uh, contact tracing. Um, so it's something that is, um, yeah, it's something that I'm just not engaging in conversations outside of this uh, space with TGI people. Um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I also really, think, I'll go for it, Jim. No, go ahead, Shella, I'll go after you. Uh, I was just going to say, it's also like, I think, I mean, you did a really good job at, uh, correlating the the two um of hiv slash aids and this pandemic of covid right it is not that black people have a gene that makes them more susceptible to these things it's the fact that being uh we have to put ourselves in risky situations right we have to put ourselves in these these spots in fact um covid when when black folks are getting you know uh are becoming exposed to it they they are turned away from hospitals and that's why they're dying at more at higher rates right um, so it's not that like I, I i just see that um i also think around in terms of like um just like there there are people that believe in the government and love the government so they like do these like you know um like the census and shit like that too and it's like, oh, see, like, this is just going to help when it's just a, another way for them to trace where we're at, trace what we're doing, trace, you know, trace everything about who we are. Mm -hmm. And so I think about those things. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Junset. Yeah, it's really alarming and extremely concerning the parallels that we saw with HIV AIDS during the crisis in the 80s and 90s. Uh, we had a week of action that ended on Sunday. So we uh, brought up a panel around HIV advocacy and trans immigration, because I do believe there are lessons. I think we have to be careful not to conflate the two uh, crises or epidemics or you know things that people are went through. Um, I know even getting testing was a major issue, right? At the beginning, like there were no hospitals were not testing people. So now you are the component of gender identity that already we or sexuality that we carry a lot of stigma already and rejection. And um, even with all the the difficult work that 
a lot of people did with ACT UP or HIV and AIDS, even with all the advances that, that, that are out there and, and, and even PrEP now being available to communities, they're still not accessible, right, to many like lower income folks, poor people, uh, trans people don't have the same access to medications as, you know, middle class, upper class, white, cis, LGBTQ folks, right? So this is the moment where they're using this pandemic to further, further reject our, our uh, existence. Mm, mm. And, and, and it's, it's not okay, right? Mm. Because the people that will have access to all those things, it will be people that, that you know, already carry so much and are having a very difficult time. I don't think there has been officially a report about there's been reported a number like a hundred thousand deaths in the US, but if we look carefully at the breakdown of those statistics, a lot of the people who are dying are, you know, black folks, they're um, people, you know, low income folks, people who don't have a home. So it's a lot of things, right? A lot of factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that that we can learn but it's it's really it's really difficult and it's 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 pain, painful to see how um you know the tactics being enforced uh, i wouldn't be surprised if they would start like arresting people for not having a mask and those ones that will be targeted out you know people that don't make people, you know, comfortable, because I can guarantee you there will be other folks walking in and they'll be fine. They wouldn't be, mm -hmm. you know, getting in trouble. So it's, it's a conversation that it's very difficult to have. It's very complex, but we have to be alert that we don't let the state further criminalize it. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, uh, I think on, on that uh, thing uh, Jenna said because they've already been and it's, it's, it's really ironic and it's, 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 that's how it is that where we've had cases where uh, you know some black folks, black men had uh, masks on so they were apprehended by the police and if you don't have a mask on then you're being harassed by, by folks as well so it's almost like you know which way do you go. Um, so yeah. Uh, and uh, last piece, uh, but this, I don't know if we have time to go through that or not, but it's the, that the, that where are folks at within the community in, 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 in recognizing and lifting the intersex identity? Because that has always been a major sort of like, you know, internal kind of an issue as well, where there was the complete invisibility and the lack of recognition of the intersex identity. So um, I don't know if you all can take 30 seconds each for such a critical question. Uh, I don't want to take away and minimize the importance of this thing, but I think this also will to, to be followed up. But if you can give us like where we at with that. Yeah, I think for us is we have done a poor job in uplifting that intersex community. I, and I think it's really important to do so because a lot of the times, even the trans movement, it's very gender, very like high standards of beauty instead of breaking away from that. So we need to be really careful and do a better job. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I second that. And I think that like thinking of terms of like, even um, so intersex folks are like, um, that the I was not included in the LGBT at first, right? And so thinking about that, as well as thinking about non-binary folks and thinking about the fact that like, um, there's just these, there's just these standards that Genesette mentioned of like, what's a man and what's a woman is, you know, and it's, and it's like, we replicate, we replicate the same system that we're fighting against. So it's, it's, it's fucked up. It really is. Thank you. Isaac? Yeah, I do think um, this is interesting because I was just having this conversation um, and I was, yeah, with a, with a, a member and, you know, there are a lot of 
there are some o overlaps of like um you know uh trans people are also um intersex and so um at least within our organization and so you know we've 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 gone back and forth around you know um uh how do we want we want to be intentional about you know not putting just putting an eye in um and and uh, not doing the work and so um there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and also thinking about if we're not um, um an organization that is um you know highlighting intersex folks and we need to like be very clear about that and um and then also we can uplift the work of, of um intersex intersex justice uh, um organizations and so there's the way that we could still do be in solidarity but we're actually in a in a crossroads of um really um having intentional conversations with our new um advisory board around um, around this topic specifically well with that thank you all very very much i mean for such an, a, a powerful powerful conversation this was uh, part 11 of our webinar series uh, power not paranoia and uh, you know every time uh, you all just bring this this amazing grace and power to this conversation and a constant reminder to us that how deeply we all of us need to be challenged with being intersectional and and then being aware and keeping our consciousness present um so next tuesday which would be the 9th of june is our war on youth um uh, conversation that's going to be the webinar to see where things are particularly now that i think there's a lot of youth being criminalized out on the streets who are part of the uprising yes uh, you know so we need to really really just keep our ears to the ground um, so please, uh, folks, uh, you know, just if you have uh, anything uh, to speak about next, you got a week to, to gather stories, get information, because this is also knowledge exchange, uh, that we are building power, how we are building information uh, to fight back and to collectively fight back. So with that, again, thank you all very much, much, much appreciated, and look forward to seeing you all next, uh, next Tuesday. Thank you. Have a good night and be safe. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Later, Genesis. Bye, Isaac. Bye, Shala. Bye, everyone. Bye, Shala. Bye, Genesis. Bye, Isaac. Bye-bye.